Okay, welcome to the 2020 fifth annual Blue Bonnet Solar Tour. Thank you for spending your time with us today. We did spend a couple extra minutes allowing a few folks to log in. We have them coming in slowly, so we did wait a couple extra minutes as folks did log in this morning. But we do want to be respectful of your time and go ahead and get started. So first off, wanted to thank everybody for their participation today. As you go through the day, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask because that's the purpose of today. As we go throughout the day, we'll actually pop up some polls as well. You'll see those pop up on your screen. If you don't mind, go ahead and answer those questions, and that just helps us as we go through the day to get a feel for where you are as, um, as an attendee. The other thing that will be happening today is we'll be giving away three prizes. Those prizes will be given away to any attendees that have registered for the event. So we're excited to be giving those away today. They are solar-powered battery chargers. So if you do win one of those, just know that we'll be contacting you via your email next week in order to figure out how best to deliver your prize to you. So if you do win a prize, congratulations and hope you enjoy it. So right out of the gate, we're going to start off with a simple poll. So just to start, if you wouldn't mind, take a look at the poll and select your answer. All right. They're coming in, looks like so far, 90% of the folks have voted, and 68% uh, of you are saying that you are in, in the boat of knowing a little bit about solar but would like to learn more. And we have a few experts as well with 32% saying they know a lot. Um, but so far, we don't have anybody claiming to be a full-blown expert. Oh, wait, we have our first expert finally signing in there, so that's great. Thank you for doing that. So that's perfect. That means that you're in the exact right place, and it also means hopefully we've established and set up the day in a way that will benefit you exactly as we hope. So I'm going to go ahead and close out that poll, so thank you for taking the time to answer that question. Today's a little different than our traditional solar tour. For those of you all who may have participated in this event in the past, it was an in-person event where you spent time learning about solar and then actually visiting members at their home. Uh, 2020 being the year that it has been, we did a little bit of a change and made this a virtual event. So thank you for attending with us today as part of a virtual version of this. First and most obvious change, obviously, is the virtual nature of it. So that means that we've done things a little differently. So you'll still get a Solar 101 presentation here shortly. That'll be the basics of solar. That'll help you give the understanding of what you're looking at when you talk to an installer, what the process is, when you work with the utility, how to evaluate possible vendors, how to look at those bids, and then how to hopefully educate you so that you can make a great decision on your solar. Next, we'll spend time telling you what it means for you to connect to Bluebonnet. How does your relationship with Bluebonnet possibly change? And what is your needs from us as a cooperative? Lastly, we want to give you a chance to meet with a couple of members. Though you may not be able to go out to their home this year, we've brought them to you. So we brought a couple of member experts that will be answering questions as part of a facilitated session. And last but not least, a moderated question and answer series at the very end today. Those questions that we have will be coming from you guys. So if you have questions throughout, just make sure you're putting them into the questions box on your panel. And also those questions came from those that you have submitted in your pre-registration. So anybody who submitted a, a question in pre-registration, we we've done our best to either capture them in the presentation. If not, we got them set up to get through them in the Q&A session. We're going to do our best to get through as many as we can in the time we have allotted. But at the end, you'll see that if you still have questions after we finish, we have a way for you to ask those as well. So thank you for taking the time to spend with us today. Hopefully, you still get a good session and learn as much as you can about solar, because that's our goal today. So real quickly, I want to do some real quick introductions to some of our speakers today. I'll come back to Micah, because he's actually our next presenter. Brittany Hardy is part of our member services team here at Blue Bonnet Electric and oversees the renewable process for our roughly 1,400 members that currently have solar or wind on their home. She will come in in just a little bit and walk you through what it means to be part of the cooperative and what it means to be a renewable member as part of the cooperative. We're also extremely lucky today to have two members with us who are willing to share their experience as part of a Q&A panel being they're both homeowners. In just a little while, we'll go into a little bit deeper introductions to John and Jerry. Selena will handle that. Jerry, just so you know, is a resident currently. He lives between Elgin and Maynard. And John resides currently in Brenham and is part of the Texas Solar Energy Society Board of Directors. But last and definitely not least, 
Mr. Micah Jasuda. Micah brings a wealth of knowledge as our Solar 101 expert. As you'll soon hear, Micah is obviously a solar aficionado and has insight to the business from multiple vantage points. Micah is currently the vice chair of the Texas Solar Energy Society and has spent years as a solar installer before transitioning and working for Austin Energy, a distribution utility, where he serves currently as the project manager of Custom Renewable Solutions. With that, I'd like to welcome you, Micah. Micah, I'm going to give you full control of the mouse for you to go through your presentation, if that'll work for you, sir. Sure does. Thanks, Wesley. So my name is Micah Jasuda. And as Wesley said, thanks for the introduction, Wesley. Um, I am on the uh, board of Texas Solar Energy Society. So we're a nonprofit uh, organization here that um, that focuses on education and outreach. And, and, uh, and um, we have chapters all over the state in Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, and El Paso. So uh, I also um, used to work for a couple of different solar installers in a past life. And for the last five years, I've been at Austin Energy. Uh, the electric utility in Austin. And I'm now a project manager with Customer Renewable Solutions. That's our solar and wind uh, program team at Austin Energy. So um, I've seen both sides or multiple sides of the industry and uh, and can definitely help answer questions. And I'm really excited to be here to talk about solar. This is my passion and what I love to do. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and yeah, I'm gonna get started. So kind of have a condensed version of this presentation. Uh, we're gonna get through it pretty quickly. I'm actually going to set a little timer for myself. So what I want to do, you know, there's a lot of information to cover in a short period of time. And so just when you're when I'm going through this, um, definitely write down questions that come up. And really, a lot of this is to give you a background education so that when you're out and talking with solar installers or, um, you know, you're out shopping, you'll have, you'll know the questions to ask. And when you um, hear something that uh, maybe is questionable or maybe something that you might have been over your head before. Maybe now you'll understand it enough to be able to um, ask questions about it, ask, you know, ask for clarifications and, and maybe know when something that someone's telling you um, doesn't quite pass the sniff test. So, so we're going to do a real quick why install solar because a lot of what I'm teaching or talking about today is, is things to be caution, you know, cautionary about, which is uh, important when you're shopping, but there's also, a, you know, I don't want that to come off as negative. So solar is certainly a great investment and a great opportunity and a, a lot of great reasons to do it. Um, so we'll, we'll start with that. And then move into the solar ABCs, give you a little bit of uh, how kind of the, I think hopefully answer some of your high level, maybe background questions about how solar works and how it works with your house, uh, how it works with the electric utility. So how Blue Bonnet handles your solar power. Uh, and then incentives, uh, there's a federal tax credit we'll talk about. And then, and then the last piece, which I wanna save time for and make sure we get uh, this is kind of all building up to the end of how do you choose an, a solar installer and how when you get bids and quotes, how do you compare those bids together? Let's see here. All right. So uh, solar is an opportunity to speak to the the independent nature of us Texans. We, you know, Texans are a very independent uh, people. We uh, we value that self reliance. Solar is a way to do that. Um, and you, uh, it's you know, power to the people. You own your own power source. Uh, that provides a lot of opportunities. You get to control your power. There are a lot of like, things that can integrate with your power if you if you have solar batteries, electric vehicles. Um, there's you know, it, it's an opportunity to buy at a price now, and then as things increase in the future, you've hedged yourself against those increases. Um, and it's it's also a good investment. So financially speaking, it has a good return on investment. Uh, typically, ten in between ten to twelve years or so for a twenty-five year uh, lifespan for the solar system. Typically, so um, it pays back for itself. It, it compares favorably to stock investments. It's a long-term investment, so it's not going to pay back tomorrow. But it certainly is something as sure as the sun rises, it will pay back. Um, and in uh, stewardship, so I know you know uh, there are different opinions on things, but I think we all agree that we'd like to leave the earth a better place for our children and grandchildren. So. This is one step towards, towards being able to accomplish that. All right. So um, I uh, don't have a lot of pictures and I'm sorry. So if you, you know, have more questions or uh, about these, let me know. Uh, but 
So solar photovoltaics is the official word. So you'll see that when you're shopping or when you're out doing research, photovoltaics just literally means light power. Um, and it's been around since the 50s, it's actually been around a lot longer than that since the 1800s when it was when it was uh, discovered, but the 50s Bell Laboratories in America really pioneered the, the modern solar panel. Uh, it has a 25 year warranty on the solar panels typically. Uh, we call them in the industry modules. So panel modules mean the same thing. Um, what else comes with a solar system? Well, you've got your racking. So these are the rails that are on the roof, typically, that the hold the solar panels that you mount them to. You have some way to attach those racks to the roof, roof attachments. So just a tip, make sure that these roof attachments, a lot of times, have I mean there's a hole in your roof. So definitely ask your solar installer, how are you attaching this to my roof? If, it's, if you have a shingle roof, ask, make sure that it's a flash penetration. Uh, and metal roofs have other options and ways to attach. You have wiring, so all of this uh, wire from the solar system has to be brought into your house. So, and then you have conduit, which are the electrical, or sorry, the metal, um, the metal that the tubes that you put the the wires in that protects the wiring and runs that conduit into your into your electric panel. And then you have the inverters. So, uh, definitely, this is something you're going to want to spend time with your solar installer asking about. The inverter is the brains behind the solar system, and there's different types of inverters out there. Uh, and each one's have their own pros and cons. Uh, and uh, typically, you know, sim simple is preferred, but uh, if your roof has a lot of uh, different faces or kind of spread out, you may want a more complicated system or you may you want more, more uh, uh, just really ask, the, ask your solar installer about the different inverter options and the pros and cons for those. Uh, they're all really uh, high, high quality these days. Typically the inverter is the, is the, the first thing that might, might break. And, Typically, you want to um, budget in a reverter, an inverter replacement at some point around year 12 uh, or so. But uh, modern day inverters have a 25 year warranty, or some brands do. So ask around, uh, you know, but the inverter is kind of one of those. The inverter and the solar panels are kind of the main two, two pieces to, uh, to, to ask about. Switch gear. So you'll have new switches installed on your wall um, to, to ensure safety. And if there's a fire, uh, department who has to come out to your house, they know exactly how to turn things off if they need to. Uh, and monitoring. So uh, nowadays you'll have some way for the data, uh, the information about how much solar you're producing uh, to get into your home internet system and then onto your computer. And there are many different ways to do that, but it's, a, it's an important piece nowadays. All right. And so just some pictures, I'm gonna kind of breeze through these. This is what's called a flash penetration. You can see the, the uh, uh, water will just come downhill over that metal, over the shingle, over the metal, and it'll never have the opportunity to go into the hole in the gear. Uh, and there's ballasted on the flat roof, you have concrete blocks. This is a standing seam roof, and this actually has no, no penetrations. You can just clip right to that standing seam. And you can see how uh, these are micro inverters that are mounted onto the rails underneath the solar panels. Again, different types of inverters. String inverters, this is kind of an old, old, simple uh, uh, brand called SMA. Uh, been around since the early 80s. Uh, this is in-phase microinverters. Uh, these are um, very popular. And this is called a DC optimizer, solar edge DC optimizer. And this is kind of a combo of the two. You've got a string inverter on the wall, and then you've got these little DC optimizers that sit underneath the solar panel. And like I said, ask your solar installers, you, you know, Chop around when you're when you're doing this, do your research. Um, but typically, these this is the brains, this is the computer behind things. So you know you want to choose choose wisely with these with this piece of equipment. All right, again, we're going to kind of breeze through some of these terms. Uh, so um, trying to uh, you know, hopefully you can follow me, but if not, ask ask later, and we can clarify some of this stuff. So this is a little bit of uh, how you're going to see bids come in and kind of the lingo of solar. So solar system sizes so um, we measure that in watts or kilowatts so a thousand watts is a kilowatt so really we're talking kilowatts in, in the solar industry kw uh, so kilowatts is the potential power output measured at a single moment in time so it's like uh, maybe like an rpm like i'm at this many rpms at this moment but that's going to constantly change as i hit the gas pedal or let off right um, so it's like your potential. So 10 300 watt solar panels is 300 watts or 3000 watts, sorry. 
3,000 watts is three kilowatts. So just as you're seeing, you kind of see the building blocks or the panels, they add up to a total system size of the, the KW of the system, kilowatts. So another way to say that is I've got a nine KW, I've got a nine kilowatt system, and it generated about 13,000 kilowatt hours last year. So let's talk about kilowatt hours. So kilowatt hours are a function of the, that kilowatt rating over time. Kilowatt hours are what's on your bill, what you're billed for. And this is the ultimate generation of, of uh, your solar system. So, uh, so same concept of your, your, your bills consumption. So maybe you have a, a space heater that draws one kilowatt. So one kilowatt over an hour is one kilowatt hour. One kilowatt over two hours is two kilowatt hours. Uh, it's the same idea with solar, uh, except it's a little more complicated because the sun is always moving throughout the sky. So it's not going to be a pure one kilowatt or 10 kilowatts over an hour. It's going to be changing as the sun goes from east to west uh, and, as the, and as the clouds come and then maybe their shade. So this changes, this, the KW is going to be changing constantly. But over time, the, the, the cumulative energy that you produce is the kilowatt hours, that's the generation. So um, a little more about that. So south facing solar panels produce the most kilowatt hours over time. The sun in where we live stays in the southern part of the sky. It goes from east to west throughout the day. In the summer, it's higher up closer to the peak of the sky. And in the winter, it's lower down. Uh, but generally speaking, south is the most productive. Uh, west facing is the second most productive. We get a little less weather in the afternoon here, a little more weather in the morning. So east facing in the morning is also okay, but uh, but there's a little more weather in the morning, not quite as productive as west facing. North facing is the least optimal. You really want to avoid that. That being said, a north facing array uh, is only about 65% the production of a absolutely optimal array. So obviously not the ideal, uh, but uh, certainly uh, still productive and, and so if you can just get closer to optimal you'll be more like 90 percent of the, the the point of the, what i'm saying is don't don't let uh perfect be, get in the way of, of great and doesn't have to be perfectly oriented you can use the geography that you have and just generally speaking the more kilowatt hours you produce per kilowatt the quicker your investment's going to pay off so the, the less shade you get the more solar generation you get the faster it'll pay off Play back for you. So uh, just a little bit about the the grid. I see that I'm I'm already taking up more time than I lost. I'm going to go through this quickly. So we're talking about grid tied solar. Uh, if the unless you have a battery, um, then you will be grid tied. So what that means is that the grid is going to step in and provide energy whenever the solar energy is not enough or not producing. So at nighttime, the grid just seamlessly comes in. One thing about solar power is if there's a grid outage, a power outage, it will have to cut off. And that is to your, your house will have to cut off as well. And that's to protect the, the linemen not working on what they think is a deadline from having a backfed solar into that line, which could shock them. And that is part of the National Electric Code. Um, so this is just a little uh, showing you the switch gear and you can follow the path from the solar down from the roof into the inverter, into the switch gear. And this is your electric panel here. That's how the solar integrates into your house. It's where the interconnection is. And then it comes back into your meter. And then this is actually where it goes down into the, back into the grid. So the grid energy is flowing back and forth through here. It's all meeting here in your electric panel. And then here's the inverter doing all of the work and, and changing that solar energy from DC to AC and getting it to be able to integrate with your electric panel. So um, this is a good diagram to show you. And by the way, this is a monitoring software. This is the output of a monitoring software called eGauge. So when you're not shopping for monitoring software, this may be one you want to consider. So the green is the solar production throughout the day. You can see morning and afternoon. And then the red is the building's load or the building's consumption throughout the day. You kind of see the cycling of the air conditioner kicking on and off. So um, the big point here is to show you how this kind of interacts. So in the morning here, when the sun is not out, all of your energy is going to be provided by the grid. And, uh, and when the sun starts to come up and starts to kick on, you can see the um, this the there's a point here where your house has part provided by the grid, part provided by solar, 
And then at this point here, it starts to take off. And now you have 100% of your power is provided by the solar power. So this white area, this overlap, that means that your solar is being self-consumed. So you're using, you're consuming your own solar power. That's, this green here is excess solar power throughout the day that you didn't need. So it's being sent back to the grid or exported to the grid. And uh, you can see these spikes in usage were actually just absorbed right into that uh, exported solar power. And that's just became more self-consumed solar power. And then as the sun went down, it got seamlessly got taken back over by the grid. And this is important because the way Blue Bonnet Electric Co-op uh, credits you for your solar power is through you, you kind of need to understand how this functions and how this works and think about what this diagram for you might look like maybe covid has changed what your red line here looks like i know it has for me i work from home now so whereas before i probably had a lot of usage in the morning and then a big dip during the day and then a spike at the evening now i kind of have more of a consistent red line throughout the day and uh so that is so that is actually to your advantage in the Blue Bond Electric Co-op because here's how it works. You're, you're build on your delivered energy. In other words, the energy that is sent to you, that is delivered to you by Blue Bond Electric Co-op, that is what you are charged for. So any electricity that you self-consume is electricity that's not having to be sent from you from Blue Bond Electric Co-op, which means that's all free electricity for you, right? You know, there's no charge for self-consumed solar power. Now, the that so this so this white self-consumed layer here is free solar power for you free as in you paid for it up front but the fuel that's coming out you're not being charged by blue bonnet for it. now this received here this green here that's what's being sent back and exported to the grid blue bonnet pays you a rate of six point roughly 6.1 cents per kilowatt hour for what you send back to the grid so it's not quite retail for what you send back to the grid, uh, but it's close. It's a very fair rate, and and uh, I'm sure Blue Bonnet can tell you a little more about that. But they, uh, but the the point here is is trying to maximize that self consumption because that is uh, power that you're not having to purchase otherwise. I know this is complicated. I'm certainly happy to answer more questions about this. Uh, incentives. So there is a federal tax credit. Uh, this is technically the last year, well, sorry, next year is the last year currently for the federal tax credit, um, but we've had, it's been the last year before and it's been renewed, so we'll see what happens. But currently it is, uh, we, we just ran out of the 26% this year, it's, it's probably not able to get it for this year uh, due to the, it being close to the end of the year, but next year it's 22%. So the way that works is your total cost, let's say you pay $21,000 for your solar system, 22% of that is eligible to be a tax credit, so 4,620. So um, you'll pay that 21,000, but then when you file your federal income taxes, you'll supply a form and uh, you will get a $4,620 $4, credit back. Now, you do have to have tax liability to receive that, So, um, but Generally speaking, most, you know, a lot of folks do. Uh, and just remember, it's not about owing taxes at the end of the year. It's not about owing taxes in April. It's about having paid taxes throughout the year. So withholding taxes on every paycheck is still paying taxes. So at the end of the year, just because you're getting a refund does not mean you're not eligible for, for the federal tax credit. I want to make that clear. All right, so how to shop. So first things first, there are a lot of contractors out there. There, there are, uh, and there's, there are some coming in from out of state. There are some who have been local for a long time. There are some springing up. So uh, a lot of different contractors and you know, solar installers to, to consider. So it becomes a little bit tough to know uh, who to go with, who to trust. So recommend first and foremost, talking to friends and family. If, if you know people who have gone solar and had a good experience, that is the, the best way to, to hopefully set you up on the right path for giving you some confidence that you picked a, a good installer. Um, first hand is always good. And if, if, you, if you'd like, you can always ask your installers to provide some references that you can talk to. Uh, Better Business Bureau is, is, is a pretty good uh, judge. Don't just go by the, rate, the letter rating. Actually look into the reviews and complaints. Yelp is also not bad. Um, and uh, it's a you know, pretty good way to see some reviews of the solar installers and get an idea for the customer satisfaction. Solarreviews.com is okay. Uh, they, they like to use 
they're, they use it as lead generation. So it's not the best, most unbiased website, but it's also a good place to look and, can, and get reviews. Angie's List as well. And then Texas Solar Energy Society is a nonprofit, like I said, and we do have a business members list and we do vet those. So we don't, if we get complaints about a solar installer, then we don't allow them to renew their business membership. So uh, always get three proposals, at least. It's just good practice for whatever you're doing, but for solar as well. Um, and you know, there's door, there are door-to-door -door solar salesmen out there, and that's fine. Uh, you know, just but don't be afraid to to say no and to uh, and to ask questions, ask tough questions. Say uh, let's 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 set up an appointment, or you know, don't don't be afraid to assert yourself and and, uh, and don't succumb to high pressure sales because that's there. A lot of a lot of door-to-door -door salesmen are very good at high pressure. Um, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Challenge them. Make them answer the questions that you're that you're considering, uh, and then have the other contractors answer those same questions and see what they say. Negotiate. I love to negotiate. I love buying a car. I know a lot of people. It gives gives a lot of people anxiety. I have fun with it. Uh, there aren't that many industries left that you can negotiate and haggle. This is one of them. So if if you like that, or I, you know, or if it's something that you're comfortable doing, definitely do it. I recommend you know. Say, you know, tell them I've got another bid, it's lower. Why is theirs lower? Talk to me, negotiate. And also nothing is free. So you'll see Facebook ads out there, free solar, Texas government solar subsidies, and it's all it's all not true. There is no such thing as free solar. What they're saying, and they're technically saying, is that maybe there's no down payment, you're taking out a loan or you're leasing it or something like that. So it's like it's free, but it's not free. You'll be paying monthly. So. Uh, just just be aware that nothing in life is free <laughs> all right so i'm going to go through these th this is the this is the end and i and now that we've kind of learned the lingo and learned how this works let's come let's learn how to compare proposals to one another uh so we want to we want to normal we're going to get different estimates we're going to get different system sizes back on our quotes uh different uh production estimates um, different prices. So how do we take these quotes and normalize them so that we can compare them apples to apples? So one way of doing that is, is by comparing the prices apples to apples and price per watt. In the industry, we speak in price per watt. What's the price of that solar panel? We don't say it's $300. We say it's 75 cents per watt. So in the same vein, when we talk about system sizes, it's a good way to compare one another. You take the price of the system, the total price, after any discounts that they're offering, just you know, take out any discounts, but before the tax credit is calculated. So after just take the price after the discounts before the tax credit, and divide that by the um, by the number of watts in the system. So for instance, this is a nine kilowatt system, nine thousand watts for twenty two thousand five hundred. So that's two dollars and fifty cents per watt. This one is 7,500 watts, 7.5 kilowatts for 22.5, and that's $3 a watt. This one's $3.46 a watt. So even though this one's, they're, they're all the same price, you can see that the per watt price system one is, is the cheapest. Cheap does not mean necessarily that it's better. Ask questions. Why is yours cheaper? Why is your more expensive? Same kind of idea here. This is, so you're gonna get different estimates. The system sizes, uh, this is all a model, a projection of how much energy that will be produced over, over the life of this system each year. So a good way to, to normalize this compare apples to apples is kilowatt hours per kilowatt per year. So um, let's say you get a, a bid for nine kilowatts and they're telling you that it's going to produce 10,350 kilowatt hours in the first year. So that comes out to 1150 kilowatt hours per kilowatt per year. System two over here is a smaller system, but they're saying it's gonna produce uh, more energy in the first year, even though it's smaller. So you'll see they have a 1400 kilowatt hour per kilowatt per year. And again, I'm just taking the uh, total kilowatt hours over a year and dividing it by uh, the KW of the system. So, um, again, so, so it's like 11,375 divided by 6.5, and you get this 1750. So system three being the smallest system of the three, they're saying it's going to produce the most energy out of any of them. Why? Why is that? So PV Watts will give you a, 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 it's a modeling software that you can use pr produced by the federal government. Very helpful. Um, 
and it'll give you an idea of what might be actually accurate for you. And, and to tell you the truth, um, most likely this one's inaccurate because this kind of number here, 1750, is really only achievable out in the desert where there's no weather and where the, the days are long and sunny. Can't really get that here in Central Texas. Uh, system two, 1400, is more like a normal solar system that's getting a decent amount of sunlight. 1150 is a very low number. So something's up there. So the questions to ask are why? Why is this so aggressive? Why do you guys predict that your system will produce so much energy? Uh, why is yours so like so conservative? What uh, is is there shade? Is it not facing an optimal orientation? Why why is this one so much less than the other? So this gives you the questions to ask your solar installer, so you can ask those informed questions. There's one last piece. Um, so. We're looking at these these projections over 25 years, and financially speaking, you are uh, the the you're you're playing off of what your electric rate is. Basically, your the the model is assuming that you're getting back for your solar power what you're paying for retail rate. So, if the retail rate is assumed that it's going to be increasing rapidly, then it's going to make year 10, year 15, year 25 those numbers of savings for solar, those modeled numbers. That, money you're getting back to make those look really large can make your payback period inflated some so some areas of the country do have three percent four percent rate escalation per year but here in blue bonnet electric co-op it actually decreased 1.18 percent over the last five years retail rates i mean it's a good thing for you guys getting low electric retail rates that are not increasing that being said it will make it just know when you're getting those solar proposals there's going to be somewhere in there small print that tells you what their assumed utility rate escalation rate is. Uh, a lot of them use 3%, but you may want to ask, would you please use 1% or would you use something more conservative? Or, or at least when you're getting quotes, try and have them all use the same number so you can, so you can uh, line them up apples to apples. At the minimum, just know that it's there and know that may be part of why one proposal may look different than another, and that is a question certainly to ask. Last thing here, uh, read your contracts. So, um, you know, contracts are tough for everything, even for your iPhone, <laughs> and we don't usually read them, uh, but this is one that I do recommend that you read. There's not usually anything super sketchy in these contracts, but um, you do have it, you have a three day right to cancel. So uh, certainly if you're feeling buyer's remorse, you should have 72 hours to cancel that. Uh, look for a timeline. One of the biggest complaints from solar, solar customers is that the installation took a lot longer than they were expecting. So see if there's something in your contract that lines out that timeline. Uh, subcontractors, so, uh, make sure that you know who actually is going to be so installing your solar system. You may be contracting with one company and they may be just subcontracting another. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but just know who will actually be on your roof. Uh, verbal promises, so if they say we'll throw in light bulbs or we'll throw in this thermostat or, or uh, we will make sure that we are there on this date to do this or that, get that in writing, get them to handwrite it, initial it, sign it, uh, you know, sign off on that. Use that contract to your advantage. You guys are agreeing on things. And then arbitration is the last one. I've never really seen this come to a head, but I do see arbitration clauses in these contracts, sometimes pretty goofy. Um, like you, basically what it does is it takes your right to sue them away. And instead you have to arbitrate out of court, but they'll make that court location like in California or in New York or something like that. So it really makes it not feasible to sue them or to, to, to try and get your money back. So it, it makes it difficult. So look out for our arbitration things. Uh, most contracts will have something like that. So don't be scared by it, but just know it's there. Also, uh, Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation has a website. You can do a license search for your solar installers. They do have to be licensed by, by TDLR as a licensed electrical contractor in order to offer to perform work or perform work. Be careful with third-party sales companies that are not licensed. And that's it. I went over time, but uh, I really appreciate everybody today, and I hope hope I was able to kind of preemptively uh, answer a lot of questions and get you guys on the right right foot for getting solar. Thank you, Micah. Really appreciate that, and appreciate all the insights you provide there. And hopefully, that's a terrific start for the folks uh, attending today to help them. Select an installer and think about how to make their selection and size of their array, size of their system, and hopefully uh, have a better idea of what the impact will have both to their bill as well as to their ener energy consumption as a whole. So, Mike, I really appreciate that. As always, thank you very much, sir.
Mike is going to hang around, folks. Um, we do have some questions coming in, so those are great questions. Keep sending them. Uh, Michael will hang around and also be one of our panelists at the very end, and we'll get through as many questions as we can. Next part of this, though, is as you would con next thing you need to be considering as you think about adding solar is uh, your connection to Bluebonnet. So, as you would guess, once you've gotten to this place where you've selected your selected your vendor, selected your side system, picked what you'd like, have worked out all your details with your contract with um, your electric uh, with your solar installer. The next thing you need to consider is connecting to Bluebonnet. So before we jump into talking to Brittany Hardy, I'd like to ask our next poll question. All right, our next poll question will be, when are you thinking you might add solar? So just take a second to answer this question for us. You guys are doing a great job answering quickly. So as of now, we're getting to about 65% of you have voted so far. And it looks like the majority of the answers, 52% say they're not sure uh, when they might add solar, 32% say within the next year. And 16% are wanting to take advantage of that 26% tax credit, and they're going to try to add it before the end of this year. So thank you folks for taking the time to uh, answer the poll. Appreciate that. Now we'll turn it over to Brittany Hardy. As I mentioned before, Brittany Hardy works here at Blue Bond Electric Cooperative and helps oversee our roughly 1,400 members with renewables. So Brittany, I will turn it over Good morning. All right. So, um, what does it mean to be a Blue Bonnet member? Um, Blue Bonnet is one of the largest co uh, electric cooperatives in the state. Since 1939, we've been committed to providing safe, reliable, and affordable power to our members in 14 Central Texas counties. Um, Blue Bonnet is a nonprofit distribution cooperative. This type of co-op buys electricity from wholesale providers, arranges for its transmission, and distributes the power to members through the co-op's power lines. So now that you know a little bit more about Blue Bonnet, um, we can talk about connecting to the grid. So the first step is, of course, selecting your vendor. Um, after that, you would submit your interconnection documents. Typically, your vendor is going to fill those out and submit them for you. We'll work with them to get those documents completed and approved. Um, the documents and designs should be um, approved by Bluebonnet before the vendor starts your installation to avoid any delays in the inspection process. Once the design and documents are approved, your vendor will proceed with the installation and let us know when it's complete. Uh, once they complete that installation and they let us know, we set up an inspection. You don't have to be on site for the inspection, but you're more than welcome to do so. We try to coordinate that with you. Um, for the inspection, we go out to your location. We simulate an outage. So we're going to confirm that your solar array does not feed back onto the system during a real outage, which Mike had touched on a little bit earlier, because that would cause a safety hazard. Um, once we confirm that your installation is safely connected to the system, we leave that array on and we put you on our renewable rate so that you'll receive credit for your production. So how are you billed? On the renewable rate, when we talk about that rate, um, you're still, any consumption that you have is at the standard residential rate typically. Um, any production from your solar array is going to run into your home first. And um, so what you see on the reporting that you may have from your inverters is the total number of kilowatt hours produced by your solar array. And as Micah mentioned um, again earlier, you would self-consume um, a lot of that. And anything that you do not self-consume would push back onto the grid. So what we call that is overproduction. Um, any overproduction that exceeds your consumption is what shows on your bill. So when you receive your statement, it'll have what you overproduced, so what you didn't self-consume and you pushed back to your meter, 
and then it'll have whatever you pulled from Blue Bond, which is your consumption. And that's, of course, during cloudy days or nights or whenever your consumption exceeds your production. And that is all I have for now. All right. Thank you, Brittany. So just short and sweet in terms of what it takes to connect to Blue Bonnet. The goal for Blue Bonnet has always been to make that as simple as we possibly can for you. We do work, as Brittany mentioned, with your installers to help that process move along as simply as we can. So as Brittany walks through that, so hopefully now we've connected the dots between making your selection, thinking about what you need to connect to Blue Bonnet. Now we'd like to take some time to introduce you to two homeowners who have been willing to share their time with us. But before we go into this next section, I'd like to ask our last poll question, and that is, what is the number one reason for adding solar to your home? What is your number one reason? All right, getting some great responses quickly on this one. All right, looks like we already have 70% voted. So this one was, we have a pretty close tie. So right now we are sitting at 41% of you say it's cost savings. 41% of you say to produce your own energy. And then 19% of you say for environmental benefit. So thank you everyone for voting. Appreciate that. That's actually very helpful and helps us uh, know your reasons why you'd be adding solar. So thanks for participating in that poll. So next up, I would like to introduce Selena Flores. Selena Flores is another great member of our member services team. Selena is normally the first point of contact for both members and installers when answering questions and assisting in the application process. So if you've ever called in and asked a question, or if your installers ever emailed us, I promise they probably got Selena. So with that, Selena's gonna serve as our moderator between our two homeowners today. So Selena, I'm gonna turn it over to you so that you can ask questions of John and Jerry that our members have asked. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. All right, so just a little bit about our members. We have Mr. Jerry Douglas um, on the phone. He um, first installed solar back in 2016 and has since um, expanded on his system, bringing him to an 8KW system that he has now. And then we have also on the line, Mr. John Gardner. Um, he has actually had solar on his past three homes and currently put or, and currently has a 9KW system um, on his home that he's had um, on there since 2017. All right, so um, why did you pursue solar, um, Mr. Jerry? Uh, for the cost, cost savings. All right. And why did you pursue solar, John? Well, the, uh, I first started in solar in, tw in 2004, so I, I'm probably an early adopter of, of uh, solar. Uh, the price for solar panels in 2004 was about just under $5 a watt. Nowadays, they're at 50 cents to 60 cents a watt. So, you know, it was more expensive, obviously, for me to start doing it then, but that's what we wanted to do. And um, so originally it was, uh, we, we got into solar to offset our uh, cost from the utility. And, um, but at the same time, it was important for us to do that as a, as a way of uh, decreasing our carbon footprint. Uh, we had built an energy efficient house and we were trying to do the best we could for that. And the solar was uh, our way of reducing that as far as we could. Awesome. Um, Jerry, what advice do you have about picking an installer? Uh, uh, the research, uh, uh, Micah, hit it on the head uh talk with uh sorry about that talk with uh you know each each installer or each uh company get as much information from, get from them as you can i ran into a situation where uh i had a salesman that was just that he 
didn't have a lot of information to give or, or some of the questions that I asked him about it. He uh, really didn't have an answer. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, just, just uh, check them out. Check them out the best you can. Thank you. John, what are the top things to consider when looking into solar? Uh, there's uh, several things. One, one is is that you know is to go to a solar tour. So everybody online now is doing the correct thing to do. Is you'll get more information from uh, people like myself and Jerry. Uh, you'll learn about how it's how that works with the utility, and and that's a good start. Uh, the second is to uh, come up with a realistic budget for how much you want to spend for your system. Um, not everyone can just offset everything that they they use during the year, uh, but it could be that you could offset 50% of it. Um, so come up with a with a, a reasonable budget figure. I mean, you're not spending grocery money on this on solar panels, so you've got some discretionary money to put into these things. So come up with a with a reasonable uh, budget. And then the the installer can help you determine how many panels you need in order to to match that budget figure. Um, talk to people that have got solar. You'll learn about those if you go on the tours. Um, there's a lot of people that have solar, and most of them will be very happy to talk to you about how they did it, show you the system. Uh, they 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 are pretty proud of what they've got, so they'll love to talk to you about that. Uh, there are uh, Austin Energy, for example, and CPS both have uh, recommended installers that they have vetted to uh, to install systems in their territory. Uh, the Texas Solar Energy Society that Micah talked about uh, has a list of business members. Um, these are these are a good place to start for uh, coming up with some uh, people to talk to and and to call. Um, you know it's okay if somebody comes to your door and ask about that but i would i would start first with uh, some recommendations from known organizations that have done this before um and then talk to the companies that you know pick three of them that you want to talk to and have them come to your house so talk to them on the phone uh with with the COVID, it's much easier for them probably to talk to you on the phone to begin with ultimately they'll want to come out to your house they want to see what orientation that they can use on your on your house. That can be done via Google Earth, so a lot of that can be done remotely. Um, and and the, if you go to the uh, Texas Solar Energy Society website, there is a list of questions uh, that you can that are recommended that you ask the installers uh, and companies that are interested in doing business with you. And um, and it's important to ask those questions because they, if you know, if you're if they give you confusing answers, if they don't answer the questions in a way that you understand, um, if they're hesitant to answer questions, then you should just tell them that no, thank you, you appreciate coming out, and uh, send them away. Um, and then and then you know, is it are one of the things that you want to look for with an installer is you know, are they friendly? Are they personable? Do you want to, are they willing to talk to you? Do they answer all your questions? Um, do you have a good feeling about the company? And also ask them for recommendations from customers that they've already installed systems with. And then call those people if they if uh, will allow you to do that. Um, that's the best advice I can give is to talk to somebody that's already doing it and has used a company that they like. Thank you. What did you find most interesting and surprising about the process of adding solar, Jerry? Uh, say that again, I'm sorry. What did you find most interesting or surprising about the process of adding solar? <laughs> that wasn't me answering. Uh, I guess the uh, one of the most interesting things that I found was that you there there are more uh colored panels out there uh when uh i picked my first or or installed the first 3kw i think there was a black panel and a silver panel uh was all we had to choose from uh, and so uh it was on the south side of my house 
southeast, so I went with the black panel. Uh, when we installed the second five KW, uh, for whatever reason, I was just thinking of keeping the panels the same. So I went with the black panel, and it's on the east side of my house, southeast side, east, east, southeast. And so that's the front side. And uh, my wife's not too happy about the black panels on the front. But uh, anyway, we've gotten past that. Uh, mm -hmm. So just, you know, ask about uh, the colors of the panels, the colors of the of the rails, uh, a lot of the things that Michael was talking about, uh, you know, the processors, the, the inverters. Uh, my panels, uh, the second set, have microprocessors on each panel. Uh, you know, try to uh, visualize where the piping or the wiring is going to go. Uh, especially when it becomes exposed for the uh, fire department. Um, those were things that I kind of learned as I went. So uh, uh, now that I've done it once, uh, there's there's some things I would do differently uh, the next time. And John, what are some misconceptions about solar? Um. I think the most common one is that it's that it appears to be very expensive and complicated. And, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it used to be a lot more expensive than it is now. And uh, it's it, it's uh, in fact, utility scale solar is now less expensive than uh, natural gas and coal fired power plants. So it's a it's a it's a good investment. Um, I, I, you know, Talk, you know, people ask me about the payback on the system, and um, I'm not really too concerned about that. But I would say that if you have a solar system on your house, uh, effectively the utility is sending you a check every day for the power that you send back to them. And there's not many investments that you'll find that uh, uh, that that will happen. Um, it, uh, uh, the complication of a system is based on really on on how the system will be. Uh, installed on your roof. Um, some houses are all chopped up and that means they have to put panels on uh, different sides of the house and get to, in order to get a size that's good enough to uh, offset the power that you want. Um, that makes the installation a little bit more complicated, but the system itself still works exactly the same way as if all of them were on the same side of the house. Um, one of the, to go back to the previous question, one of the interesting things that, that people find out once they get it installed in, is that they can monitor how much power they make on a daily basis or a monthly basis or over the year. And uh, people become quite enthusiastic about that. And so I think that people feel good about having the solar once they have it installed. And um, and it's and it's pretty easy for them to talk to other people about the same thing. Thank you, uh, thank you both for you know taking your time out to to answer these questions for me. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Selena and John and Jerry. Absolutely, thank you for sharing your insight and your experiences as you went through and. Uh, selected solar, Jerry. That's a very interesting point. I would have, you know, would have never thought about the fact that the panels themselves have the ability for uh, them to be different colors. So when they sit on your roof, you have a chance to actually maybe try to align it closer to the color of your roof. That's a that's a great point. Uh, it's always great to hear from members in their processes. So I, I'd like to ask you two gentlemen to stick around and also ask Micah to unmute himself uh, for now. Time for rapid fire question and answers. Uh, for the next uh, 29 minutes here, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. And some of you have submitted some of these through pre-registration. Some of these have come in today. So thank you guys for all the questions you're submitting. Don't stop submitting those just because we're going to go through this next portion of the uh, presentation. But um, I'll try to do my best here to submit it to one of you to start. And But if anybody else wants to add to, a, uh, to an answer, they're more than welcome to do so. So... First question out of the gate is, what do I need to consider to have solar and I, if I want to be off-grid? 
Micah, I'll shoot this one to you. And then John, if you don't mind weighing in as well. Great. Thanks, Wesley. Um, well, there, there are first thing to consider is why, why, what, you know, what you, uh, your motivation is for, for wanting to be off the grid. Just know that um, if you are truly, there, there are different configurations, you're truly off the grid. Uh, it, it means you, you're basically your own electric company. So just know the complications that come with that. There are modern technologies that make this more simple. The uh, something breaks down, you can't call the utility company. You have to have an electrician. So uh, and then uh, so if there's not a, a, a real need or uh, for going off the grid, maybe it may not be the best choice. But uh, but if you do want to go off the grid, the first thing to consider is that not only do you need to provide the amount of kilowatt hours that you consume, but you also need to be able to provide the spikes in kilowatts that you that you achieve throughout the day of the year. Um, and so you need and to do that, you need batteries. So you cannot only have solar, you have to have batteries. So then you, you could also integrate a generator with with it. But the first thing to do is to take an, an accounting, an account of all of the different plugs and loads and things that draw electricity in the house. Um, and you have to you, you figure out the electrical information, the the uh, the KW that they draw, uh, and then you you sketch out how many hours per day you use those things, uh, and then that's going to help you size up the batteries. Uh, and then what you do with the batteries is basically you double that, or maybe even triple that, because you need what's called days of autonomy. So if the sun doesn't come out the next day, you need to have enough energy banked up in those batteries to provide not only for that one day, but also the next day, and potentially how depending on what safety margin you want to run, the next day as well as that. Uh, so uh, back in the old days, batteries could only be discharged to 50%. Now they can be discharged if you use lithium ion batteries down to uh, all the way down either to zero or to 20%. But typically you want to have save a little bit of, you don't want to discharge it all the way. So not only are you doubling or tripling the size of the batteries for days of autonomy, but you're also going to want to add a safety padding margin in there to make sure you don't discharge the batteries all the way. So it's a lot to consider to go off the grid. Typically, people mostly do it when they have a piece of land that doesn't have electricity already serviced to it. You're going to pay potentially forty dollars to $50,000 or more for electricity to be brought to that land. And so might as well put that forty or 50000 to something that you, know, you never pay an electric bill for. Uh, but there's a lot to consider for going off the grid. Uh, grid tide is, is, is way more simple uh, and, and easy to, to accomplish. Um, I, I agree with that. Uh, the, the first system that we built was a battery backed up system. Um, we were attached to the utility, um, but we built uh, we we built the house uh, from scratch, and so we put in two panel boards, and we put one third of the house on the utility and two thirds on the solar, and. Um, you you become and, and we had issues uh, with uh, outages, um, hurricanes came through where we'd lose power for a couple of days, and um, and so the utility would go down, but we were still making power from the uh, the solar with the battery backup. So that that makes you feel pretty good about it. The fact that you're doing that, you become very cognizant of the amount of power that each and every appliance in your house is is using. And uh, you know the big three: the air conditioner, uh, hot water heaters, um, electric ovens and stoves, for example, and refrigerators. Um, those are the ones that we actually had still hooked up to the um, utility and weren't running off the solar per se. So um, you know, Mike is correct. It's 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 more complicated. You, it would uh, you can talk to an installer about that, and they will they will help you through the process of calculating. Uh, the size of your battery bank, the number of solar panels that you need to keep those charged all the time, um, et cetera. So, uh, so look at those things as well. And depending on the battery make, there is maintenance issues with batteries. If it's a, um, a flooded battery, like a, like a car battery type, then you've got to maintain the levels in them and the electrolytes and all that kind of stuff. So there are issues with maintenance on battery systems. So, um, that's we had, we had a good time with it, but uh, we're happy to be using the grid as a battery. I do want to add one more thing. Uh, 
the, the future is moving towards a, a much more simple experience uh, for using batteries as backup, not necessarily for going off the grid, although that, that will happen too, but just nowadays the Tesla Powerwall is becoming more and more popular and there are products like that. You just install one or two of those and know it's, it's not gonna take you off the grid, but yes, in a resilience, in a situation where the grid is down, uh, it, it is very user friendly and it can take over and, and it's not gonna run your air conditioner most likely, but it'll run you know, things keep the lights on and, and some fans and you can boil water and, and, and things like that. And that in the future, we'll have more and more of those of, of integration with lithium ion batteries that are very user friendly. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so, Brittany, I had a follow up question to that one as well. Uh, I know that Blue Bonnet needs to be aware of solar panel installation. Do they also need to know if I add a battery? either during the initial installation or later on? So the answer to that will be yes. Um, Blue Bonnet does need to know if you um, add battery or anything like that to your um, home. You can definitely add it later. So if you have uh, solar panels now and you wanted to go back and add battery, you can most definitely do that. That's still gonna go through the same process um, as the initial installation. So you would still follow um, the process where you submit the interconnection documents and we go through and we inspect and everything like that. But uh, yes, we do need to be made aware anytime batteries are added. Thank you, Brittany. Jerry, I think we'll toss the next one to you. How do I know the total production of my solar? Uh, you know, each the, the installer should be able to tell you approximately what each panel will uh, will supply in KW plus uh, for instance my system has a uh, um, due to the uh, the processors microprocessors I can actually see how much each panel is is producing instantaneously and then an overall uh, and it's I guess each installer has, has you know, different uh, different programs and different processes uh, that they can help you with. Uh, you know, our our last set was installed what five years ago, four years ago, and uh, things have things have really gotten better since then. So as far as uh, monitoring your system and and knowing how much each each panel is producing. I'm sure is a whole lot better than it was then even. No, thank you, Jerry. So it sounds like uh, if I understand you correctly, then the information's coming, is that coming, you said the microprocessor, so is it taking the data from the panels or the inverter or both? Uh, they're taking them from both. Uh, I okay. had a, uh, a problem with the processors and when I called the, uh, the installer's help desk, they were able to see that uh, the processors uh, were working fine, but I had an inverter issue and he came out and did a little tweaking on the inverter and uh, and it, it bottom line turned out to be that I just didn't have the, uh, uh, the internet strength uh, due to where my router was located. And so I had to put in a few boosters around the house to kind of get all of the all of the panels reading properly. Uh, okay. the, other thing, the other thing too is that uh, Micah mentioned that uh, uh, the installers use uh, the, the most common uh, software that they use is the PV Watts, which is a, a free software that anybody can can have access to and to uh, estimate the kilowatt hour production for a year. Um, a lot of times that's actually in the contract uh, where they say that they will, quote, guarantee that you'll produce X number of kilowatt hours per year. And that's usually based on PV Watts. Um, so at any time, you could actually go to PV Watts and, and compare what they say that you should be getting with what you're actually measuring or coming off your uh, monitoring system. Um, my experience is that PV Watts is pretty conserv conservative. And um, it, all of the systems that we have had have actually generated more power than what PV Watts said they would, uh, just as as an original calculation. So, 
it's a it's a good check, and you can uh, have you have your installer come out and look at it and see what if they uh, agree with that. Thanks, John. We'll move on to the next question we have here, and actually, I'll toss this one, John and Jerry, both to you guys. Uh, one of the questions is, can I install solar myself? And we'll start with uh, John. We'll start with you, and then follow up with Jerry. Um, the answer to that is uh, yes and no. Um, I have actually installed solar myself, but I worked for solar design and installation companies, which gave me kind of a, a heads up on uh, the proper way to install it. Meet all the all of the uh, systems have to meet the requirements of the National Electric Code. Um, you will have your system inspected by the by Blue Bonnet or the utility if, uh, that you're hooked up to. Um, the thing that's leer I'm leery of it, people that install their own systems is that they are a source of a fire ha fire hazard. Um, I don't want somebody just to coming out and sticking something on my roof that might set my house on fire. So, if I, I would I would uh, simply state that that it's probably better to have somebody else do it. Obviously, it costs more money than if you do it by yourself. But the safety involved and the the uh, liability to your home and to your family, I believe, would probably outweigh that. Thanks, John. Jerry, anything you'd add to that, sir? Thing I would say is, is most most of your installers are bonded for you know any any uh, any problems that may occur. Uh, cross wiring. I had an instance where. Uh, they uh, loaded up one side of my uh, my system, and I had a, a breaker kept tripping. And uh, fortunately, I was able to to identify it just via the software. And uh, when I called them back up and explained to them what I was seeing, I sent an installer out, and that's exactly what they found. They didn't they didn't balance the system. I didn't have four KW on you know on each. Uh, each breaker, I had, I don't know, six on one and two on the other, and so it was uh, overloaded. I want to add to so just, uh, just oh, sorry, sorry, Jerry. No, no, I'm through. I'm through. I was just going to say, if you're installing these yourself, just know you have to basic your the skills you need are, is not just being an electrician, but also being a roofer. There's a, a leak risk uh, if you have holes in the roof, and typically those leaks are covered in in the contract. If you use a licensed contractor, um, so there's there's that as well. It's just a there's a lot to the install, and then there's one more piece too. Um, people think that they can find a great deal for solar panels on the internet, and sometimes you can, but installers have access to buying in bulk through electrical supply houses, and they actually typically get lower prices for solar equipment than you can get even on you know cheap stuff off the internet. Uh, so, yes, you pay more for labor, um, but you're getting peace of mind and you're probably getting a better pi price for the equipment as well. well. Thanks, Micah. Thanks for that addition as well. Thank you, John, Jerry, and Micah for the answer to that question. Uh, next question uh, I will pass to Brittany Hardy. Does Blue Bonnet offer rebates? That is a very good question. Um, Blue Bonnet does not offer rebates or financial assistance for members to install renewables. Um, as a member-owned co-op, any financial assistance program would have to benefit the member that received the financial assistance as well as every other member. So uh, we do not currently offer any rebates for that. Okay, thank you, Brittany. Let's see here. What is the lifespan of solar panels? And then I had a second question. Oh, I'm sorry. This is for Micah. Micah, what is the lifespan of solar panels? And do you happen to know uh, what panels have the best lifetime or lifespan on the market today? Sure. Um, so solar panels come, there, there's a kind of a comp, it's like a car where you get multiple types of warranties, uh, the bumper to bumper versus the powertrain. There's kind of the same thing with solar panels. Um, and they're different per brand, but typically there's a 10 to 12 year product warranty. That's kind of like the bumper to bumper. 
And then there's a 25 year production warranty where if something happens, they're, they're, no, they're not going to uh, cover things that are aesthetic after that 10 year, 12 year mark, uh, like corrosion or rust or something like that, but they will cover things that actually are a detriment to the power production of the system. So if you drop below a certain threshold, and that threshold 90% of day one or 85% of day one, that threshold is is at measured at certain milestones of the system life. So at, at year 10, at year 15, at year 25. And uh, and if you're below a certain threshold, then that that warranty will um, will um, come and come and, and serve in you know and correct things, make make corrections. Um, and then regarding uh, what panels last. Oh, and, and so to finish that thought, sorry, it's a 25 year warranty life, but there are solar panels that are out in the field that are 40 plus years old. Um, they do degrade over time. I think that might be a future question, but typically the warranty degradation is half a percent of the total production per year. So not a half percent of the efficiency, half percent of the total production per year is what you typically lose in the warranty. And that some different panels have different uh, different estimates for for how they how much they predict they'll lose over time. And rather than say what brands last the longest, because it's kind of hard to know that, uh, solar is generally, you know, a lot of solar brands are not that old yet. I, I would say uh, the the warranty is only as good as the company that's behind it. So uh, there are brands out there that make solar panels that are have a low risk of going out of business. Uh, and you may want to consider there are pros and cons, but you may want to consider if that's a concern for you, the, the total lifespan, picking a company that will be here in 25 plus years. Uh, and you'll, you'll see those as you as you shop. The, uh, one of the questions that I, that I get often is, uh, is hail, hail damage. Um, solar panels, the, the tier one, tier two solar panels, the, the top, top grade solar panels have a uh, they're all certified by a third party approval agency, typically like UL or CSA in Canada. And, um, and the solar panels are tested for impact from hailstones. The, the standard one, and Micah, you might check me on this, but I think it's a one inch diameter hailstone perpendicular to the glass um, at like 50 miles an hour. And, um, the good news is, is that your solar panels on your house are always at an angle and the chances of a perpendicular hit are probably pretty small. So um, uh, I've rarely seen any damage from solar from hailstones on solar panels. Um, more likely it's going to be wind driven debris like from a storm or something and a tree limb would hit them and break them. Um, the one uh location where i would not recommend that you actually have solar panels on your house is along the fairway of a golf course um we have we have seen a lot of uh solar panel breakages in those applications and uh uh i don't think it's the fault of the solar panel that you put it there so <laughs> That's a, thank you john i didn't think about golf that you know having solar panels near a golf course uh, that's definitely a, a good consideration. So for those of y'all who are listening and are near a golf course, you know, maybe uh, be cognizant of where the panels are and where they're pointing. Uh, and, and definitely, thank you, John. You actually answered another member's question regarding hail. So I appreciate that. And Micah, thank you for um, answering the question regarding the lifespan of the panel. Uh, another question we've had come in is for you, Brittany. Is there a blue bonnet charge to have a third party install residential solar? There is not. So we do not charge um, to install solar. Um, we don't install solar, and there's no charge to have a third-party vendor install solar. All right. That one was pretty simple. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, here is a heavy one. I'll actually ask this one of Jerry, John, and Micah. And Brittany, based on your experience, and Selena, if y'all want to weigh in on this one as well, are there any scams? that we should be looking out for when selecting a vendor? <laughs> There's okay. a ton of scams there. The you Facebook one that says you have free solar? So Selena, yeah, can, 
Yeah, so Jerry and Selena, and, and Jerry, we'll start with you. I mean, it, I think that's maybe the one they're referring to. We tend to see that one a lot, uh, offering free solar. Uh, do you know much about that, and what is the kind of scam behind that? Uh, I don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I got a call this morning, someone offering free solar, and I uh, explained to them that, yeah, my wife lives in the Austin area, and I explained to them that uh, we already have solar and uh, and it, uh, so you know wasn't interested but a lot of times uh, my understanding is what we find out is they will tell you they'll in, uh, that they're free but they want your rebate or they want uh, there's always a catch just just be aware that um, you know nothing in life is free so that's all I can say about that I can explain the legal loophole that they're that they're using so it's not free obviously but what it what they're what that the thing that they're exploiting is the idea that you can have solar for no money down no down payment potentially uh, you can finance it with a loan a 20-year loan so with a 20-year loan the payments are very small per month well very small they're smaller than they would be if for a shorter term right so the smaller the payments get per month they could potentially outweigh, I'm sorry, the payments could potentially be lower than the savings that you receive. So no money down with larger savings per month than the payments on the panels could, you know, that's the that's the spin. Uh, but in the reality is it doesn't usually pencil out that evenly or that nicely, uh, even over a 20 year loan. So, you know, do your due diligence. It's uh, look at, you know, Look for those catches that I went over in the presentation that may be juicing up their their estimates of how much money you'll be getting. You know the, the production estimates, um, the utility rate escalations, that, those kind of things, uh, and make sure that you really will be saving more than you're spending on the solar, because uh, typically it doesn't it doesn't always work. You have to have a really cheap price to make that, that pencil out like that. But that that's kind of what there's. It's a, definitely a scam because it's not free. Uh, but that's that's what they're their ultimate goal is. And that, that's how solar really propagated in California so much because their rates are double ours. So effectively for the same price, they're getting double uh, double the payback, about, you know, half the payback period. And this is Brittany, I wanted to add something. Um, so if you have a vendor that promises that you'll never get an electric bill or that you won't have to pay an electric bill or anything like that, that's definitely a flag um, because if you overproduce, of course, we're still going to send you a statement. Um, but if they promise you that you'll never pay a bill again, then that's that's probably not 100% accurate most of the time. That that goes along with uh, there was a question earlier about uh, you know uh, renewables. And bottom line, the sun doesn't shine all the time, and the wind doesn't blow all the time. So you know, just know that I think John mentioned battery backup or even a, a Mike has set a generator. So uh, you know, that's something to keep in mind that the uh, sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So just be aware of that. Well, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for weighing in on that one. I know that one's one that uh, if I were looking into solar, I definitely would be curious about. So definitely thanks, everybody, for weighing in on that one. Um, Next question coming in, I'll actually throw to Micah and John, you're welcome to weigh in as well. Does my roof need extra support for the weight of the panels? So I'll, I'll take a quick stab and John, you're the engineer, so you may have uh, more to add, but typically it, it depends on the roof, but typically the answer is no. You don't need more support most likely. Uh, if you If you have a standard residential roof, you should be fine. Solar panels typically add about three pounds per square foot. So it's pretty well distributed and the connection points to the roof are only connecting, to, should only be connecting to the rafters. Uh, there may be some newer methods that connect to the decking of the roof. I wouldn't do that personally. I'd make sure they're connected to the rafters. Uh, so if you, I have seen the only roofs that I've seen that could not support solar were kind of uh, barns. Uh, some I've been on like a horse barn uh, where I didn't feel safe walking on it. Certainly, you wouldn't feel safe putting solar on it. 
Uh, but three pounds per square foot is 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 not a not a large amount. The the weight is very distributed. Um, the same. I've got similar comment in that uh, uh, we we. We have our solar panels on our barn, but it's the most strongly built barn I've ever seen in my life. So the, the panels are actually screwed directly into the, the roof joists. Um, several years ago, somebody sent me a picture of uh, some solar panels that were on a house in Florida and um, a hurricane came through and it blew the roof off the house, except for where the solar panels were mounted to the roof. So that would tell me that that was pretty probably a pretty strong connection to the roof. Um, the third thing is, is that I do um, electrical drawing reviews for uh, systems in and around Dallas, and uh, the utility up there actually requires a structural engineer to stamp the drawings for, for the systems that go in um, on, not, not in every city, but at least in some of them. So it may actually be a requirement that a structural engineer has to look at the house before the system can be installed in some places. Thank you both. Um, let me just say this, one, to, to all the attendees and, and definitely to the panelists. We had a ton of questions come in, so I know that we didn't get through all of them, but hopefully we got through a majority of the questions um, that we could. If you did not get your question answered today, have no fear, we'd love to make sure that we get it answered. So as you see on the screen right now, you have renewables at bluebonnet.coop. If we didn't get your question answered today, or if the question got answered, but maybe you had a follow-up, you're more than welcome to email it to us there, at renewables at bluebonnet.coop, or always reach out to us via phone as well. If it's a question that you'd like to pose to Micah, our, uh, the gentleman who did our Solar 101, or to John and Jerry, our two homeowners, just make sure that you let us know that that's who you'd like to address the question to. What we will do is then we'll reach out to those individuals and ask if they'd be open to answering the question, and we'll email it back to you. So again, thank you for all the great uh, questions today and, and all of the time spent. Uh, I would be remiss if I also didn't thank our presenters. Uh, I want to thank you, Micah, John, and Jerry. Thank you so much for being a part of the day today. We really appreciate your expertise and your candidness and sharing your experiences um, and helping our members as they go through to make their decision on hopefully whether or not to add solar. So to wrap up the day, so thank you again for, for attending. And before we wrap up, I do want to ask Lisa Ogle to come in, because as I teased you in the beginning and told you that there was a chance to win a prize, Lisa's going to announce our prize winners, and we will reach out to you via email next week to find out the best way to deliver the prize. Lisa? Congratulations to Gail Bright, Richard Corley, and Elaine Heyer. We will be contacting you to mail out those prizes. And thank you to everyone again for attending. Thank you again to everybody. As you see on the screen here, if you did register through the Facebook page, check your emails and be looking out. We will actually offer the recording of the webinar to you after as a follow-up next week. So if you have any follow-up questions and you want to re-watch the webinar, you're more than welcome to do so. Again, as I mentioned before, if your question didn't get answered or you want to follow up, please reach out to us, renewables at bluebonnet.coop. We'd be happy to work with you or point it to the homeowners as well and ask them if they'd be willing to weigh in. Thank you, everybody, for all of your time and your attention today. Happy that we could be a part of your morning. Thank you for giving us your time and hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Goodbye.